Hello and welcome to the WIHS Journal, Public Affairs from 104.9 FM. I'm Paul Kretschmer, discussing the proposition of whether or not the Green Revolution can save people money with the utility bills in the future over the long run. My guest today is Jack Kerfoot, a consultant and former employee of the utility industry based in Houston, Texas. No, that, that's, that's basically it. It's basically what the, the question you're asking is, is renewable energy, can renewable energy actually reduce the cost of power for the average consumer? And the answer is yes, because the cheapest form of power without any subsidies is first onshore wind at about 5.2 cents a kilowatt hour, followed by solar, followed by hydro, and then even natural gas, which is very low right now. So actually, yes, with the investment in renewable energy, uh, you can actually see your uh, power bills go down. And, in fact, that's why renewable energy 15 years ago, 2005, was about only 5 or 6% of our total power, and coal was 51%. And in April of last year, coal was down to 22%. Renewable energy was up to 24%. So utilities basically go to the state power board with uh, two, when their proposals are focused on two things. First of all, power reliability and second of all, cost. And so that's why the power companies across the U.S. have been making the move from coal to renewable energy. Um, has that been happening in regions at a faster rate than up here in the northeast where I am? I, I remember, for instance, back, oh gosh, at least five to eight years ago, driving through Iowa and Minnesota into Wisconsin because I have, I have family out there. I've lived in Connecticut for almost mm-hmm. 40 years, but I've got family out there. And all over the place along interstates 35 and 90, for instance, or 80, I saw turbines out in the fields, and there were a lot of them in, in some areas, not as many maybe in some other areas, but certainly something that I had not seen at all here, on, here in Connecticut yet at that point. Well, I think the answer to your question is there's two things that that region had to their advantage. First of all, it's a lot of uh, open plains and with the winds that are steady out there and not a high population density. And the second factor is they have quite a few, quite a bit of competition with, with utilities. So the competition along with the space and availability drove in, uh, companies to make these moves. Uh, someone that I that I met in 2005 and had dinner with, T. Boone Pickens, was in the oil industry, and he explained to me in 2005 why he was moving from oil and gas into a wind for that for that reason. In Houston, when I where I lived, I could literally go online and choose from over 20 different companies to buy my power from uh, for a three, six, or 12 month period of time. Now, in the East Coast, which you're going through right now, is a major uh, re- uh, development for offshore wind. And that's going on from Maine all the way down to North Carolina. And the focus there for the utilities is to replace the power plants from, first initially, it will be coal because of the high cost of coal, uh, with clean green energy from the offshore uh, power plants or offshore wind farms. And then also we'll see that the cost will actually be cheaper than coal. But then uh, also, obviously, there are the advantages of the, uh, the fact there's no greenhouse gases as well. I have noticed that there's been a certain progression as regulation has changed. For instance, here in Connecticut a number of years ago, the Public Utility Authority, which has gone under a couple of different names during that period of time, essentially said, regulation-wise, we're going to separate the generation from the distribution. And so the companies like what used to be called Northeast Utilities, which is now called Eversource, sold all their utility uh, generating plants because that was under the law and they kept the distribution portion of the business right. and as a result of that the plants that were coal are the ones that got shut down and the ones that were convertible to to, to natural gas for instance or a new plant such as here is in Middletown Connecticut right on along the Connecticut River were built to take natural gas as a source of power and then now more recently in the last two or three years the state's been making a lot of effort toward getting into that kind of renewable power like the, like the turbines offshore. As a matter of fact, the, the administration of Governor Ned Lamont has actually stressed improving the harbor facilities in places like New London, Connecticut, near the um, U.S. submarine base because right. the port there would be quite um, usable for the materials handling and so on for those turbine projects out in Long Island Sound or even further out towards Nantucket. 
there, there is a tremendous competition along the East Coast to, for these different ports uh, to determine who will be the port hub to provide operational support for the logistics to maintain these offshore wind farms. Uh, but we've got to recognize, although we're, we're starting to see that boom of offshore wind in the U.S. along the East Coast, this has been a, a, a been used in the Western Europe now for well over 20 years. And now we're seeing other countries like China, Taiwan, Japan, South Korea also to, to be uh, invest heavily in offshore wind. The strong, see, winds are stronger offshore than they are onshore. They're stronger and more consistent. And just a two mile an hour difference, let's say 14 miles an hour to 16 miles an hour, the power output doubles. So those stronger consistent winds means better, more power output, which means cheaper power and cost to the consumer. Now, as a result of that, uh, does that mean um, that the machinery itself is relatively trouble-free, or does it take a certain amount of maintenance in order to keep things turning properly, which in turn would cause some people to wonder about navigational safety and things like that if these things were standing out in the water like that? Well, the first thing we have to realize is the first First groups that always raise concern, and, and I don't push back on this, I think it's always important that everyone needs to step forward with their concerns, are fishermen. Uh, the first offshore wind farm was actually in state waters off of Rhode Island, and initially the initial concern were the fishermen. After 12 months, they've come back and said, uh, we like this, because they're creating many reefs out there from that standpoint. Anything that's put offshore, either in state waters, which go, typically goes out to 10 miles, or in federal waters, which is beyond 10 miles, have to be in full compliance with the Coast Guard and uh, for relative to the navigation facilities from that standpoint. But what you actually find in a lot of cases is the, the, the wind turbines uh, on the offshore area are constantly monitored primarily now with drones. Uh, and so the question each time that the drone is looking for, they're looking for wear and tear, and they're actually measuring the output capacity for each of these wind turbines. So they're determining the efficiency, and what they're really asking is, at what point in time do I shut down this, this individual wind turbine and replace it with, replace, for instance, the props or do a major overhaul in this system? So it's a continual effort to try and de determine how you optimize these wind turbines and maintain a steady supply of power and minimize cost. One of the questions that broadcasters get from time to time is how dangerous are their broadcasting towers for birds? And we always hear stories in the business about hundreds or thousands of birds on occasion rumored to have, to have hit a broadcasting tower be simply because it's there in, in the path of, of, of migratory birds. Right. Are there concerns about that sort of thing with a turbine or not? <laughs> Well, you, you had that erased initially by concerns, but you'll find it, it's less of a con far less of a concern offshore than it is onshore. Because onshore, you always have to worry about migratory patterns. But anything onshore, any uh, wind uh, project, wind farm that's planned, one of the first uh, groups they meet with is uh, different uh, scientific groups, uh, Ottoman societies, particularly to discuss bird patterns in the area, migratory bird patterns in that area. Uh, and quite candidly, now the actual speed of a wind turbine, it's not like a propeller on, a, uh, on an old prop-driven dri plane. They turn actually quite slowly, even though they generate significant power. So typically, if a bird is killed uh, on a wind turbine, typically what you find is it is a small bird that's being chased by a predator, and so they use the wind turbine movement as a way to try and escape that predator. And the bigger, perhaps slower bird, or maybe not as agile bird, will... Uh, they're the ones that end up uh, getting uh, hit by the wind turbine, and uh, they're the ones that uh, do expire that way. So quite candidly, the death from birds are going into a clear window, into a building, or into a house is typically greater than what you're going to find from a wind turbine. I did notice, in, as I said a few years ago, driving past some of these uh, structures out in the Midwest, and I did notice that when going past them, if I, if I really wanted to hear if there was any noticeable noise or, or anything of that sort, that I really had to open up the windows of my car if it was the kind of day that air conditioning would be running because with the windows closed, all I saw was the thing slowly moving in the wind, as you pointed out, not, not rapidly but relatively slowly, and there wasn't much to hear, really, unless you were either fairly close or you had your windows open. Yeah, you see, what people don't realize is that over the last 15 years, 
technology on these wind turbines has made huge progress. So it used to be 15 years ago, a wind turbine might have a capacity of one megawatt. Today, we're seeing wind turbines generate capacity of over 12 megawatts. So the speed, the noise, the speed is slowed down, the noise is diminished, and the power output is increased. All of these are better for the people in the area that happen to go by these areas, and obviously better for the environment all the way around. Depending on how large a structure may be, uh, is it possible to estimate how many of these in a given area that a utility would need to have in order to generate the kind of power level they would like to see? Well, typically what you find is that they know exactly, uh, they'll look at the particular areas, they'll look at the wind patterns and the wind currents. So typically what you see, let's say for utility-scale power plants, is typically anywhere on shore from 250 megawatts to up to maybe 750 megawatts, which is comparable to a power generation for a coal plant or a modest-sized gas plant. Uh, from that standpoint. So the power output for the utilities are actually is very similar from that standpoint. Now, when we talk about going offshore, now we're talking about perhaps 30, 40, 50 of these wind turbines offshore that are mounted on platforms, although there's new technology where they're actually floating. Uh, and so now you're going to see outputs of maybe 1,500 megawatts, 2,000 megawatts, or even 3,000 megawatts. Why do you... Can you tell us why it seems to have taken so much longer to happen here in the, in the United States as opposed to Europe? The thought that occurred to me when you said something along those lines was, well, gasoline in Europe has been a whole lot more expensive for a long, long time than it has been here in the States. And it may be a matter of simple economics. The, the higher the price goes for something, the more likely someone's going to push for something that's a little more economical and maybe here in the States. We simply had such an abundance, or we were willing to import a good deal of it, as the case may be, that there wasn't the kind of pressure on a practical level to push that kind of development for this kind of renewable energy along, maybe. Well, now that's the key question we've got to ask. Is we look at a country like Germany, for instance, which is one of the early movers, what they had is a very high dependence on coal. And so the air quality was uh, very bad, uh, perhaps almost close, well, not as bad as China has right now, where you have to understand the major cities in China, they have and this is a UN and also World Bank estimates, the air quality, they have somewhere between 500,000 to 750,000 deaths a year, uh, just from uh, premature deaths a year from the air quality. So Germany was struggling with coal, and so they wanted to move away from coal. They could get cheap, inexpensive gas from Russia, but they were concerned about being dependent on uh, the, <laughs> the former Soviet Union for their major power. So they started pushing down the path of renewable energy, first of all, on shore wind. Now, again, a country like Germany, relatively modest in size but high population density, they started looking to go offshore, as also did Denmark and also the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom, particularly in Scotland and along the East Coast, started pushing for the offshore wind early on. And again, it was an idea of energy independence and energy security. The United Kingdom used to have significant amounts of gas reserves, but now those reserves are diminishing. Ultimately, they'll be produced out, and so they're seeing more uh, dependence or more reliability on renewable energy. What people don't realize is if we can move to renewable energy, we will be energy independent for the first time, quite candidly, since about 1950. In 1950, the U.S. went from standalone net producer and consumer to starting to begin our independent or dependence on foreign oil and natural gas, well, foreign oil in particular. So I think that's the reason it started in Europe. Again, it's a higher cost from that standpoint. It was also an air quality as well. Thank you very much for making your time available at this time of the day to spend some time with, with me and with listeners here in uh, the Northeast, Jack. Thank you very much. Paul, thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Okay, that concludes it, sir. Thank you uh, for your... My guest on today's broadcast has been Jack Kerfoot, a utilities industry consultant and former employee of a utility based in Houston, Texas. For further information, call us at 860-346-1049. The opinions expressed are those of the participants, not necessarily those of the staff or management of the station. I'm Paul Kretschmer on the WIHS Journal, public affairs from WIHS Middletown. <laughs>